thank you for uh, coming so promptly. My name is Maya Tudor, and I'm a professor of politics and public policy here at the Balotnik School of Government. We have an exciting panel here this morning, and the theme of the panel is the collapse of trust in government, something that was already alluded to this morning in the theme panel. Will democracy survive? So I'd like to uh, begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, to my right here, we have Heather Marquette, who's a leader in development politics at the School of Government at the University of Birmingham. She's a political scientist by training and has extensive international experience, both working with government and writing on government on the topics of development, corruption, and the politics of aid. Next, we have Abu Ralstein, who is a professor in government and public policy also here at the school. Abu has written extensively about corruption in government, is perhaps one of the foremost political scientists in the world on the topic of corruption. He joins us from, he's now a professor at the Balotnik School of Government, but joins us from the University of Gothenburg recently, where he headed the Quality of Government Institute, which publishes extensively on the issues of corruption and how to maintain high quality political institutions. Next we have Stephanie Shakespeare, who is perhaps has had the most diverse career of us all. And I, in a quick research, um, I found that he has worked as an artist, a teacher, a headmaster, a politician, a political commentator, and was the co-founder of Yuga, where he now serves as a CEO. And finally, we have Diane Cloridan, who is uh, the head of the McKinsey Center for government, although I gather he's just been there a few months. He's the former finance minister of Denmark, and he heads what is now McKinsey's global hub for research in, and innovation in government. So as with the previous panel, I'd like to begin by asking one of our students to stand up and ask a framing question for the panel, which will guide some of our deliberations. I'd like to introduce Erdene Elvedorg, who, Erdene, if you could stand up, is in the front row here. Erdene is a Mongolian citizen who's worked as a molecular biologist and has set up his own NGO in Mongolia to engage in cancer research. <clears throat> He's also worked in South Sudan as a member of the Mongolian Armed Forces. So, Erdene, if you could please kick us off by starting with your question. Thank you, Maya. Uh, hello, everyone. And before I get to my question, I just want to give a little background on my country because it ties in to this panel. Uh, Mongolia, we're sandwiched between Russia and China. Very small in terms of population, only three million, but a large one in land and a rich one in history and culture. Um, in 1989, we, had a we transformed from one of the most isolated, closed communist regimes in the world to an democratic and open state in a very undemocratic neighborhood. Um, the simultaneous transition to a multi-party system and the free market has been a success, and every four years we have a free, fair, democratic election. But over the last couple of decades, there has been deterioration in trust of our, you know, from the people of the government. Um, and this is fueled by challenges such as corruption, and the inability of some politicians to deliver their promises. And this, this trust has you know, made qu people question their trust in the government and also a small fraction of the country, a very small fraction sees Russia's autocratic regime as more decisive and China's seemingly swift response to corruption as more preferable. So, you know, but I still believe in democracy and I think you know, it's the only system that respects everyone's word and voice. So the main challenge and my question is, how can we rebuild trust and at the same time bring integrity to democratic governments throughout the world? Thank you. All right, so I'd, I'd like to sort of piggyback on that question and, and put my first question to Bjarne um, and ask about the decline of trust in government and why it matters. We heard this morning a certain amount of hand-wringing about the decline of trust in uh, governments by their citizens. But, and there's an implicit sense that government 
that this is a crisis. There's a crisis in trust in government. But let me just kick off by, by asking, um, why do we care about trust? Well, as a former politician, I, I spent uh, many uh, uh, mornings biting my nails and, and caring about trust, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the poll numbers and, 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 and the volatility you have in most, in most uh, democratic systems uh, these years, including uh, the Danish one. But I think, uh, I think you're kicking off this discussion with, with just the right question, uh, because I think it's, it's relevant to, to, go, to go one step back from discussion and trust and, and try to focus on the functionality of, 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 the whole, of the whole discussion we're having on this panel. I think if you, if you look at the numbers, there's probably no, no doubt you, you, in, in the introduction to this theme, we're talking about a breakdown or a collapse of trust. I don't know if I'd use those terms, but there's definitely a, a, a steady decline uh, and a very steep and rapid decline in trust uh, across very different nations and very different geographical and, and cultural uh, settings. Uh, some of it has to do with, with deep-seated problems like corruption and, and stuff like that in, in, in developing nations, but you also find it uh, in, in very developed and, and very modernized nations like, for instance, uh, the Nordics, uh, uh, Scandinavia. So uh, it, it's, it's relevant to discuss uh, the question and, and the challenge as such. Um, but having said that, I think you're, you're phrasing the right question because at least in my mind, and that's just an introduction for, for, for discussion, I think part of this decline has to be uh, has to be well explained by some very fundamental changes in in, in all nations and, and also of course in democratic nations related to globalization uh, and related to uh, increased volatility in the political systems uh, in democratic political systems uh, and and to be very blunt and direct about that I think of course we have to focus on one the, the, the problems related to that and, and the challenges and how to rebuild trust in, in a sufficient manner. But, but also to some extent we have to just accept uh, that, that there's, a, there's a rational feature about the level of distrust in, in, in many nations. Uh, some of, 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 of the citizens that don't trust their government, they really don't have no reason to trust their government. They're, really, they're responding to, to lack of delivery and, and, and to functional challenges. Uh, and I think um, the development that took them to a position where they actually question uh, the performance of their government and where their evaluation of and their trust in their government is dependent on their view of, of performance, what government is delivering and, and how government delivers uh, what it does, whether it's transparent or accountable. Uh, the, the journey that took them to a position where they base their trust level and their assessment on that instead of, of, of deeper sources of legitimacy like, well, class-based voting or tradition or whatever, legitimized political systems in the past. I think that journey, uh, in a way, is in, in, it's inevitable. Uh, it's, we, we can't move back in time on, 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 on those issues. And actually, we shouldn't wish to, because uh, there's something fundamentally democratic and something fundamentally right about educated citizens being critical about their government. Uh, and at least in my view, um, that lead, leads us to, to well, a crisis, to, ch to challenges, uh, but also to a point where we should basically focus on, on the way government works, the way it functions, the way it delivers, what it delivers, and how it delivers the, the results that citizens are, are demanding. And I think one last point on your, on your opening question is that even though I'm uh, my, my basic position is, is, is realistic about uh, just levels of distrust and in a way I understand them. Uh, you also have to, 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 to recognize that at a, there's a tipping point. At some point, the level of distrust hits, uh, hits a mark where, where government gets difficult and where the uh, reforms that change, uh, the, the levers you have to pull to make government de deliver and work where they just seem to stop functioning. And, and I think the real question for me, uh, and that's the case here in this panel, it also was the case in, in, in government, is whether you can avoid that tipping point uh, while still moving forward uh, and changing the way you govern to deliver results that will allow you to rebuild trust. Great. Thank you. So I just want to turn directly to, to Heather, so from a politician to a political scientist. So both... Former, former politician, uh, three months, three months ago. Um, so 
both both Ogene and Viana have have linked trust very, the crisis and trust to democracy. In fact, our panel overall asked, "Will democracy survive?" So, is the crisis and trust also a crisis in democracy? Are those the same crises, Heather? What do you think? I don't know if anybody's had a chance to see Jonathan Friedland's article this morning in The Guardian, which is a, a very long and, and articulate article about the crisis of democracy in the US. And so coming from the US originally, it's quite a distressing read, I have to say. If you think that, that the foundation of representative democracy is the notion that we entrust politicians to look after our best interests, and that they'll deliver when they say they'll deliver what they say they'll deliver. And if over time, we get shown again and again that we can't trust them to do this, that they're not looking after our interests, whether that's collectively or regionally or, or so on. And if they don't deliver, then trust in that system seems to be breaking down. And one of the things that struck me that you said that this was about no matter what, democracy is still the best system. And what I'm worrying about is that when you look at a lot of the data, you're starting to see that becoming less and less of a certainty. Um, so in the article today, and I don't have the, the exact percentages, but one of the things that, he's, that uh, Friedland was pointing to is that in the U.S., something ridiculous like 42% overall of people surveyed believe that, in, in effect, a strong leader is better than a democratic government, that you need a strong leader. When, you, when they poll Trump supporters, that rises to about 58%. And I don't know if those are the exact, but they're, they'll ballpark. So if you have the US, which is supposedly a bastion of representative democracy, having such a significant percentage of people saying that they don't trust the system of democracy anymore, that's definitely concerning. In terms of corruption, and I hope we'll talk about this a bit more, a colleague of mine has been doing a pilot study in Indonesia, um, looking at the effect of different types of, of anti-corruption messaging on people's trust in government and their propensity to act. So we presume when we, when we put out messages about anti-corruption that it will encourage people to, to fight against it and to, to support cleaner government. And what she's finding really disturbingly is, is not only that a lot of anti-corruption messaging isn't effective and that it doesn't actually encourage people to act, but actually it puts people off of engaging in politics overall. And in some cases, certain messaging might push people towards the kind of populist, quite extremist candidates that we're talking about, who will always go on a platform of cleaning up government and so on. And so one of the things that she's questioning in the next stage of the research is actually, has the, the push towards good governance in the last 20 years or so, is that actually partially responsible for breaking down trust in government? Because if you keep telling people how bad their government is again and again, eventually they start to believe it. So well, that's a nice segue into um, a question I want to put to Stefan, which is um, on the role of the media potentially in, um, in facilitating this decline in trust in government, and whether the media is, is um, at least somewhat responsible for, for the decline in government trust um, one could say that this is not so much a crisis in trust of trust and a, tr a crisis in government as it is that citizens are now with a the glare of the media spotlight on the practices of government just much more aware of the, the dark underbelly of what governments do and their less savory practices and are now exposed to it more but that really nothing has fundamentally changed. Yeah, I, I think it depends what you mean by media. If you include uh, all of media, social media, then clearly that environment has made this lack of trust um, uh, become more so uh, because it's created so much visibility. Uh, but with that increased visibility, you also get increased noise, and it's quite hard to measure, to come up with one of the questions you asked the, in your uh, briefing here was about the metrics uh, of this. Uh, and it's very hard to measure these uh, things because... Um, it's, it's a relative measure. Where if people know a lot more, if people are more engaged, if people are becoming more critical, then it's rational for them also to become uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more distrusting. Uh, so I don't know if we actually have, have a crisis or not. I, I, I look at it, though, through the lens of uh, not of the metrics of, of distrust, but what's happening to the consensus that we've had. So we've had a, 
On the left, there's been a consensus that have, that have sort of been from the center uh, to, the, to the more, you know, to the flanks, and on the right from the center, uh, uh, and then uh, to the flanks there, and you've, you've got Trump coming along and Sanders um, coming along and proving incredibly popular, uh, breaking up that consensus. So Trump is the first Republican we've had who's rejected Wall Street. Uh, well, it, it's not so much, a, I shouldn't say consensus, it's a, it's a deal, isn't it? It's, 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 it's sort of, we will be the party in, in the case of Democrats of minorities and, and the oppressed, but we also have to take care of business, the sort of Clintonian view. Uh, and that's what Sanders doesn't care about. Um, on the right, you've had your Wall Street Journal uh, Republicans who are in uh, free trade and, uh, and all of that and, 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 uh, and keen on uh, openness and uh, therefore uh, and you've got the wing that, that is anti-foreigner, and they've sort of made a deal uh, that will put up with some negative social values in return for, for, for Wall Street being protected. Trump has come along and said, what's good for Wall Street isn't good for, uh, uh, for Main Street. Uh, here we've had that same breakup. We've got two major elections now uh, in the American uh, presidential race and in Brexit that represent uh, this anti-establishment movement of these people who feel the world has passed them by when we look at, when we analyze economic, uh, 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 their sense of, of uh, uh, whether the economy is getting better for them or not, uh, the most consistent driver of voting for uh, uh, Sanders to a less extent, Trump to a greater extent, and voting for Brexit is these are people who feel they're in the middle and it's all passed them by. The rich have got richer, uh, the, the, the welfare recipients and minorities have done better and they're left behind. Uh, and it's being driven by that. So, I think they're much more, this anti-establishment movement is much more uh, driven by uh, these disparities that are felt, again, I think partly because of increased visibility rather than because they're necessarily so real. Boo, I know your work deals a lot with the question of corruption. So how much is the crisis in trust and democracy a result of increased visibility of corruption? And how much is it driven by other factors? When, when people are asked around the world in surveys uh, what makes them think that their government is legitimate, uh, this research comes with uh, a big surprise. Uh, most uh, political theorists and political scientists would say it's democratic rights. If you have democratic rights, you can vote the rascals in and out, and, and you have you know, right to free speech, and so that will create democratic legitimacy. Yes, democratic rights are important. Economists and, and welfare state people will say it's output, what you get from the system, you know, in terms of pensions and health care, and so that makes it legitimate. And that is also important, but both these things, both output factors and democratic factors, are far less important than how people perceive that they are actually procedurally met by the government. It's things like the rule of law, control of corruption, government competence, how the tax authorities, how the school principals, how the social workers. So that, and that is the state, how people actually meet it. And this is, I think, very interesting because it points out that these procedural things, that is where the trust thing comes in. And um, we have, during the last... 30 years and so, seen a, a lot of procedural bad things happening. If you look at any map of levels of quality of government around the world, corruption, government effectiveness, rule of law, uh, it comes with a pretty clear s empirical finding. Some 75% of the world's population live in states with quite corrupt or very corrupt and at least dysfunctional governments. Where do you have clean government? And let me say, that could never be a corruption-free country. That would be as likely as a crime-free country. It will never happen. But it's basically, you know, it's Europe north of the Alps, west of the Elbe River, right? It's North America, where would you have it? North of Chicago, north of Illinois, I don't know. Somewhere there. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, a few very small city-states, Hong Kong, Singapore, where well, Hong Kong is now part of China. It's New Zealand, it's Australia, and then there are a number of in-between countries, Japan, Japan, 
uh, Chile, Uruguay, strange Botswana, but basically 75% of the world's population, also in democracies, live in countries with quite high corruption. Now the problem, and this is a huge problem, and I have no solution to it. Uh, you know, during my lifetime and our lifetime here, we've seen a fantastic democratization around the world. When we were young, you know, countries, it's difficult to think about that today. Spain, Portugal, Greece were bloody dictatorships, you know. That is all going Eastern Europe, most of Latin America. Fantastic. We, and we now have democracies in places you couldn't think about even 15 years ago, Taiwan, Indonesia. So the, that is, of course, wonderful news. The not so wonderful news is this. Democracy is not a safe cure against corruption. Absolutely not. Uh, uh, the curve, statistically, is, as we say, U-shaped. So uh, there are a number of quite authoritarian countries that manage to handle corruption much better than especially new democracies. But there are some quite old democracies, India, for example, that have been able for a, unable for a very long time to get their hands on this. And the worst problem here, and I have actually no solution to it, is that the accountability mechanism in democracies seems a little or quite dysfunctional. In many more elections than you would hope for, corrupt politicians are not punished, they are re-elected. As we speak, I think, I don't know if the election has taken place, but Keiko Fujimoro, the daughter of Alberto Fujimoro, is likely to be the next president of Peru. Now, if you don't know that, Alberto Fujimoro is one of the most gigantic corruption scandals we have ever seen. And we we'll see this again and again. And, and this is, uh, it's not everywhere. There are countries where if you mobilize on clean politics, it gives something. But in far too many elections, the electorate is not punishing corrupt politicians. They are re-elected. So, but let me just push you a little bit on that. So trust, you say, is facilitated empirically by when citizens interact, when they go to the front lines, the street level bureaucrats, front lines of government, and they interact and they're treated in a way that they feel as though is impartial, they're treated in accordance with the rule of law. But what if they do that and yet the government is unable to deliver economic growth? And we know that in part, trust in government, satisfaction in government, is tracked not by just interaction with government, but also, at least in part, by economic performance. So what happens if the government treats you fairly, and this is just, I'll throw that out to everybody, but in fact that doesn't end up delivering growth. And I think, Will, you alluded to this because you said democracy doesn't get you very much, right? It might, it might get you the ability to throw the bums out, although it has to be, right, even there, Fujimori may not even happen, um, well, insofar as it throws out the family. So what what do we do when government trust is, is, is brokered by a close correlation between, tr between uh, government performance? Trust and government performance are closely correlated. Well, what happens when governments are democratic but can't deliver on growth? Do we throw out democracy? And this is partly a Danish question. I, I don't think so. Um, first, if you see the situation in, in most countries since the last eight, nine years, it's not that there has not been any economic growth. I mean, you cannot explain the Trump race that there has not been any economic growth. It's the unevenness of the economic growth that is the problem. And here comes the second problem of corruption. Now, if you take a person, we have micro-level data on this. So if you take a person in Europe who says in this survey, I would like to see more economic equality in this context. But this is a person who also perceives that there is low quality, unfairness, incompetence in the government authorities. This will be a person who in the same survey would say, I would like to see less public spending, lower taxes. But the same person, ideologically, who sort of a center-left person, who happened to live in a country where he or she perceived that it's pretty okay with it. This will be a person who says, yeah, Quality of government is good. So I'm actually prepared to pay more taxes for more social spending. So I'm not saying ideology is unimportant, but it's conditioned on your perception of the quality 
of government. If I lived in Greece and someone came to me and said, would you like to pay more taxes for more public health service? I would say no, because I know how endlessly endemic corruption is in the healthcare sector in Greece, for example. But if I live in Copenhagen, I would say yes. Yeah, you I, just think, I just think it's very important to, to remember that this, this, of course, this is uh, a question of how uh, governments, politicians, public authorities interact with citizens uh, at the street level and, 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 and further up. Uh, but it, we, we, we should never forget that it's also, it's also a question about performance and delivery and results. And I think with the break up of all identity structures and old voting patterns or old cleavages that used to define, well, the, the, the basic the divisions between political parties and the formation of political parties and the ideologies in, in most democracies, politicians and, and parties and, and government officials just have to get used to the fact that they're being assessed in a more blunt way by citizens. Uh, they're being assessed by, well, what they do and how they do it, whether it's done transparent, whether there's accountability, and whether it actually works. And my only point, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing, I'm the optimist on this panel. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that role. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of trouble, crisis, and, and alarming de developments around the world. But it might, it might also just be a transition from, well, let's say the early stage of democracy where uh, a lot of, of trust was really not based on, on, on performance and not even on transparency or accountability, but on, on well, other, other key factors that, that legitimized politicians and, and political parties to, to a, a new and more, well, blunt phase where citizens really, in a rough way, assess what their politicians are doing. Uh, and, I don't think they're necessarily throwing out democracy if they don't see it working. I think they're throwing out their politicians. And I think if you look at the numbers, at least in, in some parts of the world, uh, if you go granular on them, there's a difference between the way citizens uh, trust government institutions, uh, the police, the army, uh, the judiciary, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the civil servants that deliver main public services, and the way they, w they view political leaders and political parties. And they, they, they're perfectly able, at least in, in, in my home country, to distrust politicians and political parties while they trust the police uh, and, and large parts of, of the civil service. Uh, so, so they can make that distinction. Uh, and I think uh, that points in the direction of some kind of optimism. You just have to, you just have to invent new ways of actually serving them better than what you're seeing in many nations right now. Who you want to jump in, but I just want to ask Heather and Stefan if you have a comment that you want to join into this discussion before I open it up to the floor. Well, I, I was uh, I was going to agree with Bjorn's um, right. optimism, uh, <laughs> uh, and 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 I and I think actually uh, I doubt that many people in this room would agree with me, but I'm quite optimistic about uh, what's happening with our uh, Brexit referendum because this is something where the the dispossessed, as it were, that we've been talking about, the ones that, that see themselves as the economic losers, whether they are or not, have forced on the government a referendum via UKIP onto the Tory right, uh, the need of, of, of Cameron to placate his Tory right and get that out of the way so he can win the election. He's left with this promise of having an election, uh, having a referendum, and now, lo and behold, we have a referendum against what can reasonably be described as a very remote, um, undemocratic boss of, of Europe. Now, I should say, I'm, I'm, I would probably vote to stay in, but it's a completely rational thing to want to overturn this, and we're seeing an effort which I think will not work, I think, it, I think the country will, will stay to remain, but it's a really uh, interesting democratic development. The, the mere fact that most people in this room probably can't stand the idea of Brexit uh, should not um, disguise the fact uh, that this has come bottom up. Uh, and it's been forced on, on, on a Prime Minister who wanted nothing less. And I think one of the, the turn of phrase you used was, you know, government treating everyone fairly but still can't deliver on growth. And I, I think that that's where I'm, I've always been an optimist, but where my pessimism seems to be coming from is it's very difficult to see anywhere where governments are treating people fairly. And we have a real shared problem globally in terms of a, an elite political, economic, and so on, that means that actually the system isn't fair anymore. So I was thinking if you're a 30-year-old academic here in Oxford, and you're on the bus every day driving past the professor's houses in the nice part of town, 
knowing that you will never buy one of those houses. And then you're looking at a parliament where there are a lot of property millionaires which have been built up using public funds. It creates a sense that the system is not fair. If you're a Nigerian school teacher and you see the governor driving past in a big cavalcade every day, it creates a system or the sense that the system isn't fair. And so I think actually where we need to go is we need to bring that, that equity back in, into the system. I'm also, I was also very much an optimist until the, everything with the US election this year. And I, I think I was saying to, <laughs> I was saying to Boo, and I, I'm, not a, um, I'm not prone to hyperbole or anything like that, but it's actually very scary. And I think for the first time, we're looking at a possibility where we can imagine election violence in the US. And that wouldn't have been a case three years ago. And so that is worrying. So the, you know, the, the kind of optimist, I think, and probably many of us here, keeps getting pushed down by what we see around us as actually being a, a sort of gripping of power and economic power by an elite that's not responsive. So to bring that trust back, we have to get back to delivering what people actually need, which is affordable housing, secure jobs, and good services. And I think then we start to see a recovery of trust. So I have two two fingers, Boo and Jeremy. So if you want to take those uh, briefly, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. I just want to point out that if you think about the basic of trust, is that you entrust something with something important, your tax money or your security or what it is, taking as your sort of default position that this person or this organization will actually not act in its self-interest and abuse the trust, will not just take the money, or but will look after your interest. But I'm a little worried about this endless finger pointing at governments. I think, the, not here of course, at the Blavatnik School, but I think we have taught our students for now four decades that the best way for a society to work is if everyone just look out for their self-interest. This ideology, is, I think, has devastated the ethics that is needed for a government to be trustworthy. It's, and this is an argument from Francis Fukuyama. You know, it's, he's more biological than I, so he says, the natural thing to do if you have a position of power in the public sector is to use it for yourself, your friends, your family, your political faction, your party. And so that's the innate thing to do. Not to do that must be a trained thing. So you must be trained at saying, I'm, I'm not going to hire my nephew if he's not the most competent. I'm going to hire the most competent person as a school principal. But that is sort of a little unnatural thing to do. Now, if you teach students, generation after generation, that the best thing they can do in life is just to look, if everyone just looked out for their self-interest, things would go well. What will happen in technical terms is that the participants will outsmart themselves into a suboptimal equilibrium, known as corruption. And when they are there, they cannot cut out because of their distrust in the other ones. Issue of norms. Absolutely. Yeah, just, just two points illustrating my uh, perhaps even stubborn uh, optimism about, about these things. Uh, it is not that I don't recognize the, the, the challenges, but because I do also some of the deep seated challenges about not just economic growth, but also economic inequality. Uh, I think that might even be, be the worst problem affecting this trust. So I think two points. First of all, I, I wouldn't want to move into to, to, to commenting the the political side of this, this discussion, I'm no longer a politician. But I think there is, and I think I can say that safely, there is sometimes a tendency that we, we tend to notice uh, the very visible and dramatic uh, developments in, in, in the direction of, of, of pop the popularity of politicians that, that feed on distrust. But it, you, you have to also keep in mind that we've had for, for, for the recent period, for, for the past decade, and also now having a lot of pragmatist governments around. If you look at, the, well, until recently, the, the huge popularity of Angela Merkel, that didn't come down to, well, moving to the flanks or, or, or well, some of the tendencies you see in other nations. If you look at the outcome of, of, of the biggest democratic election in the world, in India, I guess you could, even though I'm not a, an expert in Indian politics and didn't want to get involved with it, I think it's fair to, to, to well, to see that government as a reformist government. 
uh, basically a government that wants to change the way things work in, in India. So I think we have to go granular on the way we assess things instead of just well, putting all our attention to some of the most remarkable features and some of the most dramatic and something sometimes peculiar features of, of, of political development. And one second point for me is that if, if you look, if, if, if some of us in this panel are right that, that this all comes down to, at least to some extent it comes down to the way governments deliver and, and, and the way they perform uh, when they are, are challenged by the citizens to do so, uh, I think another point of, of, of optimism comes from the fact that they actually have new tools at hand to perform better. Uh, like, just like big private corporations, uh, govern, governments shouldn't, they shouldn't see themselves at, 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 as standing at a standstill point where, where there's nowhere to go. Uh, I think with, with some of the changes we see in digital uh, advanced analytics, uh, they can really change the way that they deliver things to their citizens. And, and that goes for the way they understand their citizens, the way they interact with their citizens, and also the ability to, to do better for, for less resources. So, so, well, taking that as a challenge and, and, and basically utilizing these opportunities might be one of the solutions to the trust crisis we're facing in many nations and many democracies in these years. So governments have a clear reform imperative, but they all, and they have new tools to deal they with this, tools. but also new challenges. Yeah, but it's a bit like everyone in this room knows about the, the old Juncker rule. Uh, he stated in, 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 the, in the Council of uh, the European Council that the situation in Europe was that everybody knew what to do uh, to solve the problem of their nations and of Europe. They just didn't know how to get re-elected after doing it. Uh, <laughs> and I think there's some truth to that. Uh, and, and maybe the point might be that just standing still and, and, and holding back uh, in, in times of distrust and, 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 and with the tendency we've, we've discussed today might, might actually be the most dangerous decision to take, that moving forward might, might in fact be, be, be the safest way to, to operate uh, in this environment. Sarah, you have the last word before we open it up. Yeah, um, one thing that, um, that you said earlier actually, which I just wanted to pick up on, was about um, trust in other institutions as well, so the military and police and so on. And there's been a lot of research that shows that quite consistently across a range of different regions and countries or so on, that's often the case, the most trusted would be the military and the police, and the least trusted would be politicians <coughs> and political parties. And, and I. So I'm going to, I'll say a pessimistic point and then an optimistic point. I actually think that's a really bad finding because worst case scenario, that's where you get a coup. Best case scenario, that's where you get uh, interest in big man politics and, and hardmen, the sort of people that can act like the military but do, through, do so through a democracy. And actually addressing the issue of lack of trust in our political parties is, is absolutely fundamental. So it's not to look like too much of a, a pessimist. Where I do see a lot of optimism is actually when you look at attitudes for young people, and particularly thinking secondary school through university and beyond. And even though the picture is mixed, it's generally speaking, despite all the hardships, a very optimistic, collective, <laughs> engaged uh, generation. So as, a, as an educator, as a parent, and just an observer, just like there's very scary things happening in the US, there's also very exciting things happening as well, you know, social movements where people are using the word socialism and talking about collective responsibility and collective action and so on. And, and that's also part of the story of what's happening. And if that side prevails, then actually things could be greatly improved on the sort of, the sort of norms that Wu was talking about around rational self-interest and so on. Great, well, uh, let's open it up and uh, take a series of questions as a group and then uh, we'll ask the panel to address it as they will. Right here in the front. Thanks. Uh, Don Moynihan, <laughs> University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I wanted to push back uh, one of the conventional wisdoms that's emerging about Trump. We've talked about Trump a lot already, which is that his supporters are the disaffected losers of globalization. So exit poll data from 23 states finds that the median in income of Trump supporters is about $72,000. It's about $20,000 more than the national average, about $10,000 more than the median income of uh, Democratic supporters. Uh, what does predict Trump's support relatively well is uh, people who have racial bias and animus and he plays on that very well, and people who believe that government does not work effectively. 
And so I think Trump, it, to some degree, is the product of a belief in government as a failing entity of a generation of voters being told that government is the problem rather than the solution of the problem. And he's incredibly adept at exploiting that, not just among working class people, but people who've actually done quite well in the last generation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Wajalka. I'm from the OECD for the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building. And I had a question, in, f in fact, in listening to, to you all, that even though you referred a number of occasions to um, a cross-section of regions and countries, that we still had a tendency to be talking from a very north-centric uh, uh, position. And uh, the, the, the organization, uh, the networks that I, that I work with are essentially networks of uh, development partners and governments that are really f that work in fragile contexts, so uh, fragile and conflict-affected countries. And I'm just wondering, which are also encouraged to democratize. In fact, the pact that they have with the international community is that after the conflict is more or less over, that they adopt electoral reform and so on. And um, I just wondered. Uh, the kind of positive optimism that you're expressing, how, we, how it transposes into this context, how governments ha are constrained or able even to consider delivery on the scale that you were suggesting, uh, Heather, and, 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 and whether those governments of fragile contexts are actually in control of their destinies in a way that could in, in, uh, um, create more trust and build trust. Um, I'm slightly pessimistic about that. Um, I just wondered what you think about that. Thanks. Let's take one more question. If we can pass it right there to Felipe. Right in front of you. Right in front of you. There we go. Hello, thank you. My name is Jose. I'm an MVP student here at the, at the school. Um, I had one, one question along those same lines. Is, well, this, if this is a problem in the US and the UK, you can imagine. I'm from Colombia. You can imagine how this is happening right now in, in South America or in Latin America. And I wanted to raise your attention about the effects of this lack of trust. Um, one, of, one of the effects could be, and, and is actually, the incentives, the negative incentives that it creates to, attr I mean, to attract um, professional, young professionals or successful professionals to, to pursue a career within the public service. Um, if this happens, I mean, for 20 years, a whole generation will have basically a whole public service made up of people who joined the public service because there was nothing else to do. And all of the su successful people in, in the market went to the private sector. So my question is, from your perspectives, um, what could we do eventually to deal with this lack of trust and start attracting, um, convincing successful professionals that a career within the public service is a possible way forward. So thanks. Okay, we'll stop there. So, um, Stefan, why don't we start with you? Um, so we have three questions. One about the, the demographic trends of Trump supporters. Another one about how some of the questions what we are, what we've been discussing translate into fragile um, countries that are trapped, are emerging from fragile political situations, and how these questions of trust transpose into an environment or or affect the future of um, yeah, the younger generation and their attraction into the public service? Mm -hmm. um, so on, 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 the, uh, 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 on the question of the demographics of Trump supporters, uh, I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, uh, in polls, people do tend to exaggerate their, their income. Uh, we have very clear and large-scale evidence of, of uh, uh, talking to more than 200,000 American voters that that's in fact uh, there's a correlation of people who perceive their economic status to be getting worse, uh, being much more likely to be Trump supporters. Uh, I don't think that's, um, uh, I don't think it's the rich and, 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 and uh, positively minded that are going out and voting for Trump. Um, the, uh, on the last uh, point, I, I, I don't, I have no ability to answer your question. I have no understanding in, in that area. Um, but we do a lot of work in Singapore, and it's very interesting how, uh, how relatively um, content people are with, with their government. Uh, we um, polled the uh, last election for the University of Singapore in some detail, 
And while there are lots of things that people are annoyed at, there are no burning issues. Uh, and I think people feel that if they have a government um, that, uh, um, that they broadly support and that they, they uh, as I think you've pointed out, is not, is, is not seen as particularly, is not actually very corrupt. And of course, pays its public servants uh, a lot. It pays them as much as, um, uh, as a typical banker uh, in, 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 in the sort of casino part of, of that city. Uh, the, 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 we've had dealings directly with the top civil servants and the politicians, uh, I have, and uh, it's quite remarkable the totally different nature of the conversation um, that you have about policy and, uh, and about what we're doing, um, the work we're doing with them, um, that they are totally focused on the engineering uh, of government. Um, it, they're, they're, they have almost no interest in anything other than engineering a solution to problems in front of them. Now, it's a small five million population or six million population. I don't know if it can be um, pre uh, pushed beyond that sort of size, but you can absolutely see the success of having very uh, smart uh, and well-paid uh, civil servants and indeed politicians. Maybe you, you can really answer the question about the, you know, you work on, on, on aid and politics of aid. So can you maybe say something about the question of how we think about the decline of trust and in the context of not just decline of trust, not just a crisis in government, but also a, a, a crisis in the very fabric of, um, of the state. I mean, one of the things that I think that, that your, your comment and question really raises is, is you know, we're, what we're often, what we've been talking about is a decline of trust. What do you do where there's been very little trust to start out with? or where the, the decline in trust is as a result of conflict. So, so not just economic decline or the kind of existential crises we're talking about, but, but you know, genuine, um, genuine conflict. And I think that's something that we need to be thinking about much more seriously. I don't, what I like about some of the, the things that are happening right now is, is I like moving away from this sort of dichotomy of developed versus developing. And the OECD's work on global dads, for example, recognizes that some of the challenges that we're facing at their heart have similar, they have similar um, sort of themes that we're, we're talking about, but the scale is on a completely different scale, and that needs to be taken into account. And I was just one of the things I'm really interested in is the sort of unintended consequences of what we do. So what's the unintended consequence of, of including democratization as conditions for post-conflict reconstruction support without recognizing some of the challenges of democracy that might be fundamental? Um, even little things like I have a really good friend working for a donor agency based in Somalia who keeps pushing back on his central agency who want him to keep running randomized control trials. And he keeps saying, no, this is an extremely low trust environment and we're going to be setting up control groups and, and, not, and, and that will be, that's potentially dangerous. And actually thinking about trust as something that's fundamental to that peacekeeping process. Um, I, I absolutely agree. Your comment, I have to say, was, was fantastic because I think at, at its heart, this lack of trust, if it goes into the next generation, then we are looking at a very poor pool um, for our political leaders in the future. There is some really good work coming out of the UN's development programs. It's a global center for public sector excellence, which is based in Singapore. But one of the things they're trying to do there is to, to reinvigorate a debate about why people should be going into the public sector and bringing pride back into that, that role. So focusing much less on, on anti-corruption and much more on integrity and values and and what contribution people that the public sector makes. And, and I think that's where, where we should be moving, is much more towards actually the, the positive side of public service without talking so much about the, the negative side of it. So, Joanna, do you have anything to add or should we take another round of questions? Uh, I would like to add to this question about um, what to do with conflict within societies. Uh, there is a big debate in political science now about the two potential one problem you have is that in countries with a very weak <laughs> civil service, state apparatus, public administration, uh, introducing elections uh, will lead politicians to be very tempted to use the public sector in order to give jobs to their followers or nepotism and clientelism and so on. 
states will try to increase state capacity. Uh, I have a bumper sticker on my car in Sweden. I bought it in the United States. It reads like this. Be nice to the Americans or they will bring democracy to your country. <laughs> I mean, th this is a real problem, of course. I mean, we have had a lot of elections in, if, in if Afghanistan and in Iraq. I mean, it, it, this is not... So I will be the last part person arguing against democracy. But democracy only without reasonable state capacity will not work. Now, government agencies can dramatically increase that trust. My best case is from my, the country where I used to work, Sweden, in the 1970s and 80s, the national tax authorities had extremely low trust, really nothing. Today, it's not the police, it's not the military. When we ask every year confidence in like 30 public institutions, the institution that has the highest trust in Sweden is the National Tax Authority. Why? It's a long story. It started with them inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stan. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Don't forget. That's quite something. Yes, but it, and it's very high. It's very high yeah. today. Could I, could I just add three points to the questions? I think you're absolutely right to, 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 to warn us against a North-centric uh, kind of, of, of focus in this debate. It also it relates to, to uh, well, Bo's description about the default option in, in most of the world being pretty different from what we're used to in, in, in the Nordics and even here in, 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 in the UK. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that, that on a very broad basis, I think we, and that's also an optimistic point, that some of the new tools and some of the new ways to, to, to solve problems for citizens, to engage with citizens, to, to deliver transparency to citizens, some of the digital tools, some of the, well, basically innovations uh, that, that we are focusing on right now and, 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 and working with the, in, in McKinsey, we should be very cautious not to look at them as, as advanced tools that will only be available to advanced governments. In, in fact, they, they, they can be employed all across the world. And, and in some instances, they allow governments that are very challenged and very fragile to leapfrog into much better performance with, within quite short time periods. And, and that's, I think that's a point of optimism. And at least for me, there's, there's a bias that when we, when we talk about advanced and technological and, and innovative issues, we, we limit that to, to the part of the world that we, we tend to, to look at uh, upon it as, at, as advanced in, in, in the first place. And I, I think that's just wrong. So that's a basic point, at least for me. On, on the civil service, I think uh, a brilliant question. Paying people more uh, tends to help um, in, in many different, under many different circumstances. Uh, well, being the former leader of the Danish civil service, I, I think that, that option was not available uh, and, uh, for many reasons. And I think maybe it's not even the most important thing. I think for, for, for many, uh, for, for the civil service and for the public sector in many nations, some of the basic values and some of the basic, uh, well, the basic mission is, is actually in, in pretty close alignment with the basic values of, of many millennials, uh, if you look at surveys. So in, in my mind, the challenge is, is, is more about the way we structure uh, our, our public service, the way we, whether we open it up to, to, to new forms of engagement, shorter, uh, more agile forms of, of employment. Even in a very advanced nation like Denmark, I think it's fair to say that the public sector is pretty closed. It, it's, it's hard to, to, to move in, and it's actually also pretty hard to move out of it and, and back into the private sector. So there's a lot of work to be done there, but I think it, it's more about the way you, you, you technically set up the access to, to, to the public sector than the level of, of, of pay, at least in my mind. Last question on, 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 on America. Again, I'm absolutely not an expert, and I wouldn't want to move into to a very political discussion, but I think when, when we look at this, the, the phenomenon, uh, the, the, the current campaign and, and, and some of the tendencies there, I always remind myself that it's only seven and a half years ago that the majority of the American voters united behind a slogan uh, saying, yes, we can. And, and that, that slogan is, seems to be almost forgotten now. But, well, those three words, they were about performance, weren't they? They were about the ability of government to change things for the better. And, and, and 
people united against that, or behind that message seven and a half years ago. And, and maybe some of the discussions we're having in the US now is really not about very fundamental challenges against democracy as such, but about a, really a discussion about whether we could, but you could, whether you did deliver, whether that experiment in government actually delivered the kind of results people expected, uh, and, and what not to do if the answer is partly no. Um, I think you have to, to, to look at it in a pragmatic way also, uh, instead of seeing it as a basic challenge against democracy as such. Well, I know we have lots of questions, but we also have a conundrum because we have five minutes left in the panel. So I'm really going to just choose two questions I'm going to ask of you very brief. Um, and we have one here in the front. Do you still have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Alexandra. I'm a student here. Um, I come from Romania, which is basically a very young democracy still. Um, and I think that uh, in my country, I've seen um, that uh, uh, the collapse in trust of government has ultimately led to a lack of trust in democracy itself. And uh, nobody um, can say that loud, but we have politicians who are running for office and they say, vote me if you don't want a politician in office. And that's absolutely uh, against the idea of democracy. Or you have people claiming that uh, uneducated and poor people should not get the same kind of vote as the educated one because they are going to elect also the populists which are clearly corrupt and um, who are going to stay in power. So in this context, um, <laughs> I'm wondering how you can rebuild trust in democracy. And we've discussed about the responsibility of the politicians, the responsibility of the government, but what about the responsibility of the citizens? How can you, we actually build an accountability mechanism without citizens? Because it's not only about the politicians, and if we discuss about democracy, citizens count, citizens are not just uh, the amount of people that vote for you. Um, thank you. One more question, the people over there. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll add to citizens, uh, I'm, I'm Robert Tilliard, um, I'll add to citizens with media uh, and whether it's a necessary condition to have anti-corruption measures if you need a probing, free and stable press. And I think Singapore offers an interesting example of what kind of combination you need of those because there you don't have a free press particularly, but you do have low corruption in the sense of low level corruption. But there's a good argument to say that there is still a lot of nepotism in Singapore as well. Great. So, and I'm just going to ask for, in addition to answering those questions, we'll go down the line for your closing comments, and in particular for each of you to, you know, we've, we've talked about Singapore and Sweden and the sort of paragons of a virtuous cycle where uh, these governments deliver on performance. Therefore, there's trust, and then that trust is a resource which allows them to further deliver. So that's a really virtuous cycle. But how do we break into a cycle that's not virtuous? So what happens if you're not Singapore and Denmark? And in particular, if I could just ask each of you to t give me one specific thing you think that governments can do, whether it's at the national level, at the street level, to help rebuild citizens' trust in their government. I'm going to start with you, Look at the downside scenario, and, and maybe that's uh, that's a good tool for me to have to speed up the intervention. Uh, and I think my basic point here today has been that there's a possibility that you can build a virtuous circle, uh, but of course there's also a, a risk that you can have a vicious circle, uh, and that goes uh, um, that goes across a, a number of very different nations. And and, and I think my point today also, in, in spite of being an optimist, is if you can have that, you, you might see that happening, even in, in, even in some, of the most, some of the best nations, some of the best practices we, we've witnessed today. You see tendencies in, in, in the political systems of my own nation, Sweden, the Netherlands, uh, that, that also, they're volatile, they're very volatile. And I think, in, in my view, what a, what a vicious circle would look, look like uh, is really not so much about, uh, well, challenges against democracy as such or the rule of populism or, or whatever kind of discussion you have. It's really about uh, 
the, the, the government leaders, uh, that goes to politicians, but actually also to civil servants, uh, being scared by this whole phenomenon in a way that makes them hold back from reform and change. So if, 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 if the forces in government that actually realize the need for change and, and, and are able to operate the tools and levers that will deliver change, if they hold back and stand still and move into, well, identity politics or, or a, a overly focused uh, operation focused on communication and stuff like that, uh, they're not going to be able to deliver what they should to move out of the, the spot they're now in. And if that happens, you could have a very vicious circle uh, where citizens will, will basically feel that they're in a situation where, where nobody is leading the way forward. And, and that could seriously threaten uh, political stability, in, 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 in my view. So uh, in, in my mind, it comes down to the center and not the flanks and, and what's being done at the center and what's being done uh, by the people responsible for changing government, uh, rather than the people challenging them. Um, first of all, I actually acknowledge that elections are not fair. Uh, they may be free, but they're not fair. And, 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 and the role of that is addressed. Uh, and I'd like to end by answering the, or attempting the question um, about Romania. I don't know about Romania, but the, the question of how can we make citizens more responsible uh, and, uh, and be part of this uh, more actively. And it seems to me there's, there's, there's only one way that you can possibly make citizens more responsible, and that's to let them make decisions. Um, the only way you can ever be responsible is to let uh, citizens make their own decisions, but that has been no part of this conversation, and it's, it's very rarely a part of this conversation. Uh, it's always about what can politicians do to be better. Uh, but it isn't simply uh, a, a mass of people out there whose job is to vote every five years, uh, and then uh, uh, another group that, uh, um, uh, that um, has to somehow react to that. On the one hand, they want their votes, but on the other hand, they're... Uh, they, they, they don't respect them very, uh, probably behind locked doors. Uh, you know, that's always going to lead to a worsening of the situation. And that's how you get a Trump, uh, because he can come down and knock down all the pillars and, 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 and seem to be upsetting the order, and you get anti-establishment feeling. So I think a really important question that has to be addressed is how do you introduce uh, more citizen control of, uh, of, of democracy? How do you make them more involved in democracy? Not by doing the things politicians want them to do, but by taking responsibility for their own decisions in some way. Breaking vicious circles is phenomenally hard um, because they are circles, they are self-reinforcing. If given a choice, and this is based on tons of empirical research, I would go for two things. One is meritocracy, the other one is gender equality. They are basically two sides of the same coin. We find them in, in most countries around the world, you get the position in the public sector because you belong to the right party, you have the right contact, you have bought it, or you're a man. Now, if you change that and say, we, this is not long going to be the case, we're going to go for real meritocracy. And what works is not the German, Spanish type of silos, it's the Australian, Canadian, Swedish type of, of um, open meritocracy, you can say. You can actually go from the private sector if you have the real confidence. That has a very clear effect. And I, I have to speak for a long time why. But, but The other thing is gender equality. My colleagues in Gothenburg find whatever you control for, there is a, when it comes to corruption, there is a positive aspect, effect of gender equality. To my surprise, many of my dear feminist friends get a little nervous when they hear this because they smell essentialism and they're not really fond of Essentialist, but I think we shouldn't be so surprised. Open any prison system in the world, you will find that 94% of the inmates for serious crime are men. Now, most of corruption is illegal. Why wouldn't you see the same here? If this is nature or nurture, other people will have to solve this. I don't go into that debate, but it's very... And if you think about it, gender, there are a hundred ways to think about gender equality, but in one way you can think about it, it's basically about impartiality, the same as meritocracy. So these are two very strong signals about, in a game theoretical way, you say, these are credible commitment signals. A government to say, from, we will not create perfect gender equality or perfect meritocracy, that's what I'm saying. But from now, this systematic politicization, 
or gender discrimination in access to public positions is no longer acceptable. That is a very strong signal. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to leave Bo's comment on gender aside. <laughs> <laughs> the best one for, for, for lunch. Um, thinking about you know, your, your question about citizens and I think your question about the media as well. I mean, I, I say not being able to pinpoint down to one thing, but the, the two areas where I think there's a real crisis, but where you can see the beginnings of solutions. So the first, which I think we've been talking a lot about, is the crisis of leadership. We have very low quality leaders, and it's the same you know, in different contexts around the world, and we really need to think about how we, how we get better leaders. And, and to paraphrase Robert Kennedy, you know, how do you get those better leaders to work for the people rather than live off the people, in effect? So that's, that's our big challenge. And the second one is about critical thinking as well. And I was thinking earlier with some of the, the questions we were asked to think about in advance about skepticism and is skepticism healthy. And I think the difference between skepticism and critical analysis is really big. We should be critical. But skeptical means you, you maybe can't actually pick through the information that you're, you're getting so you give up. So actually focusing on improving the quality of media and reporting and the ability of citizens to actually understand the issues and to hold their governments to account is really important. So I would focus on leadership and education and, and critical analysis skills in those. Great. Well, before I close the panel by um, thanking everybody, um, I'd like to turn to uh, Dorkina Marek. Dorkina, can you stand up? Who is our one of our MPP students. Dorkina is here, I gather, um, getting her fourth degree having had an undergraduate and a, a, an MD as well as a PhD in the medical sciences. She ser has served as a senior health policy advisor to the United States Senate, and she has volunteered to give us her most important takeaway from the session. Thank you very much, Professor Tudor, and thank you very much to our panel who gave us a very um, insightful and a wonderful and a thought-provoking discussion. Um, so just some highlights from what we talked about today, um, starting off with our introductory question about how we can rebuild trust and regain integrity uh, in government. Um, first of all, we need to reflect upon what uh, causes uh, the lack of trust and what causes this decline in trust, and exactly why does that matter to us? Why is that important to us? So um, we discussed a few uh, functional challenges in government at the beginning. Uh, we talked about the lack of delivery on promises uh, and also on services, and part of that encompasses um, economic uh, promises, such as simple basics, such as housing and, um, so, uh, and quality of living and jobs. Um, so those are the kinds of things we need. Lack of transparency was another issue. Uh, lack of accountability was another issue as well. Uh, these are problems that are pervasive. These are not things that are just um, in democracies. Uh, they're also in non-democratic governments. They're also in developing nations. They're in non-developing nations. Uh, and we can see that democracy is not necessarily a guarantee of protection uh, against corruptions, uh, as citizens um, not optimally um, hold their leaders to accountability uh, when it comes to uh, these types of issues. Uh, we talked about the issue of a crisis in democracy as well, uh, and whether or not that's linked to uh, perception with regard to visibility. Uh, and um, the rise of social media was another important point that came up with regard to that. So as far as solutions, um, where are we now and what, what can we do? So we talk about treating citizens well, uh, and with treating citizens well, again, providing them with what they need for an acceptable and a decent quality of life, the housing, the jobs, uh, and so forth. Um, and also treating citizens equally. Uh, we talk about meritop meritocracy in government and ensuring that everyone has an equal and a fair chance, um, and also meritocracy with regard to the way that government is run. And finally, when we look to the future and think about our government leaders, we want to think about how we're training our future government leaders. Um, where is our focus with regard to training those future government leaders? Is that about um, having people who are, who are going to go into politics and have it all for themselves? Or are these people who are going to be more um, service-minded and individuals who are very um, genuinely concerned about the needs and the welfare of other people? Uh, so again, with that, thank you very much. Uh, this has been delightful, and uh, I hope that um, it's been helpful to you as well. And I believe we're now off to lunch. Thanks again.